So let me introduce you to the Wallace Center. The Wallace Center is a business unit of Winrock International and the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for 30 years. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. We create national communities of practice around market-based issues, enabling peer-to-peer -peer as well as peer-to-expert communication uh, to ensure efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and then back down to the groups, grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. We work with growers uh, to ensure that there's an abundant supply of uh, good food to meet the high consumer de demand, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. Uh, you can learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network and dig into our great resources uh, to help with your work on our website, which is, again, ngfn.org. Today, we've broken the presentation up into uh, two parts with two fantastic panelists, as I've mentioned. Uh, we will have a look at open water fishing, which is the dominant source of our seafood, and uh, a, a look at um, aquaculture. So uh, we will begin today with a more sustainable, deeply values-based approach to open water fishing, and I'm pleased to introduce Niaz Dori, who I've asked to hit a tremendous number of points, so hang on for a wild ride. Niaz Dori is the coordinating director for the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, or NAMA. She lives in Gloucester, Massachusetts, the oldest settled fishing port in the US, where she has been working to advance the rights, economic sustainability, ecological benefits, and food system contributions of an indigenous and community-based fishermen for 22 years. Time Magazine named Niaz as a hero for the planet and her for her work fighting against the industrialization, privatization, and corporate takeover of fisheries. Her work and approach have been noted in a number of books, including Against the Tide, Deeper Shade of Green, The Spirit's Terrain, Vanishing Species, The Great Gulf, Swimming in Circles, A Troublemaker's Tea Party, and The Dory Man's Reflection. Um, so, Niaz, take it away. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody at the Wallace Center for inviting us to be part of this conversation and for those of you who have joined it. Um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what has made us even think about fisheries in a different way. Uh, when I first started working on fisheries 22 some odd years ago, I was um, actually still at Greenpeace, and um, what I was hearing were some bits and pieces of, of sound bites and, and, and language that really alarmed me. Uh, and it's essentially it's what defines the current dominant narrative around sustainable seafood or seafood in general. I was beginning to hear things like uh, we need cheap seafood to, to grow, to feed the growing world population, that fishermen are the problem and that we need more efficiencies in the system and efficiencies was constantly defined as uh, lowest cost of production, whoever can catch the most uh, in the cheapest way. We need to consolidate the system uh, and, we, and that was part of the efficiencies uh, definition often and that ownership equals stewardship. Only those who have some kind of a major um, investment in it are the ones that are going to be the true stewards of the ocean. And then finally, we, I kept hearing this people say to fishermen, you either need to get big or you get out. And as I was listening to those, I uh, started to find some familiar um, parallels to agriculture and uh, how we heard the same things with farmers. In fact, the get bigger, get out really was what a, a quote that was seated at the beginning of the um, farm crisis, which brought us agribusiness and what was uh, then called the green revolution as the solution to all of that. And um, with this dominant narrative, what we're now being introduced to is what I call aqua business, which is the equivalent of agribusiness. And, Ironically, some of the players in agribusiness have um, 
been dipping their toes into the ocean, and they call some of the strategies uh, the Green Revolution. And so it's, it's been alarming for us, and we wanted to begin to really think about um, what are the systems that are currently in place that tell us whether or not we are meeting our potential, and they're primarily the certifications and the red, yellow, green lists, and what we realize is that they kind of serve the existing narrative as opposed to um, help us find real long-term solutions. So as an organization, uh, we find in, that, are, that we're in conflict with many of the criteria that these certifications have been um, putting out there. So what we thought we needed to do was really to start a revolution, or what we call a revolution, which is actually a term that was coined by one of the fishermen we work with from Port Orford, Oregon, Aaron Longton. And what this revolution really required is that we first had to dive deep and we had to start defining what values were important to us as an organization. And uh, in doing that, we started to look at definition of, of values. And as you can see, there are a number of different definitions for uh, value in the dictionary. I think I took this out of Webster or something. And for the purposes of the dominant narrative, value is often just defined as whether or not you're making a profit. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Ultimately, we're dealing with business people who need to make money to continue to do what they're doing. But is that really the only defining um, element of uh, how we measure success and sustainability? And so out of the definitions, what we have settled as being the definition we want to work with is this definition, principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. And the reason this is important to us is because it, it transcends uh, profit being the only way that we measure uh, value and sustainability. So for us, there are certain values that supersede uh, and, and are sort of the uber overlaying values of our work. One of them is that it's really our work is all about making sure that the marine ecosystems are healthy, that they are kept wild, and, um, and that there is, there is actually an opportunity to, for us to interact as humans with this marine ecosystem without undermining its um, basic ability to regenerate itself. And one of the major ways that we interact with this ecosystem is food. And so for us, from a food system perspective, we, we thought it was really ironic that the only thing that we eat that actually has the word food in it has not been part of the broader food system conversations, which is why we're glad to be part of this webinar and to talk about seafood and not just focus on land food. So if food is what our major interaction is with the, with the wild marine ecosystems, then for us, it's really important for our food needs to be rooted in the values of food sovereignty and food justice. And we're um, a big supporter of the, of the broader global fight for food sovereignty. And I encourage you to look up the, not only the definition, but the seven principles of food sovereignty that um, has been put out there by La Via Campesina. But in the most basic sense, what it says is that all people have the right to decide what they eat and to ensure that food in their community is fair and healthy for everyone. And for a lot of communities, so much of the world's population lives in coastal areas and they have had the traditional access to seafood and that has been what has been right and what has been appropriate for their culture, for their religion, for their for, um, for their lives, for their economies, for their communities. So this is a really important value for us as we do our work. And so when we think about those two values, we as an organization have developed um, some basic values that we operate under. One of them is that we believe there is power in uh, small and medium scale community-based fishermen in a similar way that we believe there is power and there is an inherent sense of ecological responsibility and stewardship towards the land when it comes to land food with um, community-based, small and medium-scale family farmers. And um, so this is one of the four values that our organization uh, really holds dear. 
The other is dignity for all people. We're finding that uh, within the seafood value chain, at least, um, the deep roots of uh, lack of fairness, um, unfair prices paid by, to the fishermen, uh, unfair prices paid by those who need to eat seafood, uh, racism, exclusion, oppression, all of these are part of the existing uh, seafood value chain, the way the workers are treated either on, on uh, industrial boats or in factories on land. We're actually currently working with a group of fisher, fish, fish workers out of New England um, called Fishing for Justice that are working to fight similar things that we've been reading in the news about slavery in the seafood system that seem to be so far away in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia but it's happening really here in our own coasts and waters. And another one of our values is uh, that human and environmental issues are one, that we can't separate the two. And I mentioned the uh, slavery issue. When we approached a couple of the certifications about um, dealing with and including issues of slavery, for instance, in the seafood system, they said, or in their certification programs, the response was, that's not an environmental issue. That's a human rights issue. And for us, the two are so interconnected. We know historically how we treat humans is often an indication of how we treat animals and, and, um, and the ecosystems. And also the issue of food access is, um, may seem like a human rights issue to many, but for us, if, uh, if those who have been historically dependent on seafood have to now wait for what I call unidentified food objects called, caught by the industrial seafood factory fishing operations and brought to a corner bodega at prices they can't afford um, and at a nutritional values that really doesn't meet their needs. That to, to us is part of this issue of human dignity. And finally, equitable access and fair markets. Uh, equitable access by both those who eat seafood, but also by the fishermen who are being marginalized in the system that is really considering those who have the most vested interest as the ones who really are supported by the system. And so for us, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, fishermen losing access to traditional fishing grounds with fishing rights being priced out of their reach much like land has been priced out of uh, farmers reach and so those are our values and if I broke them down into simpler terms and words this these are the words that came up in my mind wild ecosystems and ocean and marine animals as public commons uh, lives with dignity healthy food, healthy communities, food justice, food access, fair prices and wages, and safe working conditions. So these sort of summarize our and once again we looked at the existing systems that tell us what's sustainable and what is not and we didn't see a lot of those values reflected in them. So we thought what we needed to do is to start something new. Oops, I think I'm up. Oh. Let me go back. There we go. And um, the idea of going deeper and really looking beyond those criteria that are presented to us as status quo right now, the sustainability criteria, really Diane Emery from, um, uh, for, well, I should have changed the slide because since I made the slide a couple of years ago, it's now called um, University of Vermont Medical Center. And the Fletcher Allen Healthcare at the time was one of our early adopters in our new approach to looking at seafood. And what she says here is really important to take home is that they, they set out their values as an organization. They looked at the existing criteria that is out there and they realized that they didn't go far enough. So we found that we're not alone in realizing that the red, yellow, green list and the, and the certifications are a great start for people. But now we know too much and it's time to go deeper. And one of the examples of going deeper that I wanted to share with you, which for me personally, it, it helped frame my thinking, is this example of Pharaohs. I used to serve as the uh, COO of an organization called the Healthy Building Network. And when I was there, we uh, launched this project called Pharaohs. And the idea behind Pharaohs was to really go deeper. When you're going to buy siding for your home, you may be looking at durability as your primary criteria for um, for the product you're searching but then what we came up with were all these other categories that were important and so you may go onto the Kiferos website 
and you see, oh yeah, durability, this product does really well, but uses a lot of water, they don't treat their communities well, occupational safety is a problem, it's high in, uh, in toxic uh, chemicals, and so you may end up choosing a different product than what you set out to do. So part of our thinking around rethinking sustainability was to use a similar approach, go deeper, find values that are currently missing, and build a movement and understanding around what is the potential that we haven't tapped into yet. And for us, it really began by addressing similar things. What are the what are the community, ecological, economic, and with fisheries, because they haven't been part of the food system, we wanted to pull out food system and not just talk about a triple bottom line approach to sustainable seafood, but really a quadruple bottom line to sustainable seafood, until it's implicit that when we talk about seafood, we're talking about food systems and vice versa. So with that, we thought, where do we go from there? We knew that we were losing ground really fast when it came to access to fishing rights and the ability of fishermen, community-based, small and medium-scale fishermen to exist, and that industrial-scale fishing operations, whether they be factory fishing operations that are in open seas or industrial aquaculture facilities, were rapidly gaining ground. And we knew that we needed to not only bring consumers to, to this work, but also of consumers that have a, um, have a historical um, evidence that they can take political action. And community-supported fishery was one way to do that. We helped pilot the first community-supported fishery in Port Clyde, Maine in uh, late 2007. And the second one is the one this picture reflects. It was in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where I live. And um, since then, community-supported fisheries have grown to uh, all those dots you see in the map in North America. And uh, we just held our second um, community-supported fisheries in what we call values-based um, seafood businesses summit in February in Norfolk, Virginia, where those businesses, about 120 some odd people were there, came up with a whole set of core values that they felt defined how they work and how they see their work. And these values are currently um, not included in uh, the existing certifications and, um, and the red, yellow, green, respect. some of them may be, but uh, in general, most of these are not. And I encourage you to go to localcatch.org to read the description of these values uh, to find out a little bit more what's behind these titles that I've pulled in here. Where we've taken this from the community supported fisheries work, where we felt we needed to go next, because what we knew was that CSFs were really going to be once again feeding those who have other options. And where do we go from there? And we felt that it was really important to tap into the broader systems, and again, systems that not only um, represent a big chunk of the market, but also represent a system that uses their market muscle to shift policy. So our first uh, foray was to work with the healthcare system. We worked, we teamed up with Healthcare Without Harm because healthcare does have a history of using their market muscle to shift policy. You know, low VOC paint is a good example. Those of us who want to buy paint that doesn't make our breathing harder or pollute our environment can now afford to buy it because Kaiser Permanente not only was able to throw their market muscle around to change manufacturing, but they also used it to shift policies. And um, uh, we have held a number of events and opportunities with the healthcare sector to teach more and more of the hospitals. Um, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a few other hospitals in New England were part of a pilot program that we launched with Healthcare Without Harm. And we begin to see the shift in purchasing policies in these hospitals have real impact on fishermen's lives and the conversation. And a couple of years ago, or actually over the past few years, that we've been fighting against policies that are consolidating and privatizing the fishing industry, these hospitals, such as Boston Children's Hospital, have actually weighed in on those policies and have shown up at these meetings to um, help advocate for policies that help independent fishermen remain that way. From there, we moved on to work with, this is Boston Medical Center, 
to work with universities because again we felt that there was a, um, a, a place where not only we could we change purchasing policies but we could also um, tap into student organizing to, um, to change uh, policies on a political level. And um, we've been working with Real Food Challenge to, uh, we created what we call the first ever fish camp that we were able to train some of the student activists in uh, various universities to begin to organize campaigns and once again they showed up at the policy tables. And then we began to really focus on K through 12 because again there is purchasing power there but as you all know not that much influence over what you can buy and how much money you can spend. So from a political perspective, it was lower on our priority list, not because we don't think it's important, but because our criteria for who we work with was not only that they can shift purchasing powers, but they can flex those purchasing muscles to shift policies that are important to the fishermen we work with and the marine ecosystems that are ultimately our, um, our, our main objective in uh, this whole process of that we've undertaken. And so a lot of activities in various communities from students to healthcare to communities of color that have had no traditional access or say in the system and um, today we feel we're in a place where we can actually move the needle a little bit more towards a, a redefined sustainable seafood system that supports those communities I talked about earlier while giving access to the communities that actually need seafood most as part of their day-to-day -day lives. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Niaz. It's so striking to see the close parallels of the terrestrial small farming operations and the values that tend to track with those farms and small fishermen. It's really eye-opening. So now let's take a really different uh, a look at a really different kind of fishing, which is uh, fish farming. Bren Smith is a true innovator in this sector. He is the owner of Thimble Island Ocean Farm and executive director of Green Wave. A lifelong commercial fisherman since the age of 14, Bren pioneered the development of restorative 3D ocean farming, which is designed to restore ocean ecosystems, mitigate climate change, and create blue-green jobs for fishermen while ensuring healthy local food for communities. His work has been profiled by CNN, Google Food, The New Yorker, Bon Appetit, and others. In 2015, he was the winner of the Buckminster Fuller Prize for Ecological Design and the Clinton Global Initiative Award for Ocean Innovation. His writing has appeared in the New York Times and National Geographic. In 2013, Smith was chosen as one of six ocean heroes by Oceana and Future, Future of Fish Fish's open, uh, sorry, Ocean Entrepreneur of the Year. He is an Ashoka and Echoing Green Fellow. Bren. Thanks so much. What's never in my bio is my, my many nights in jail and my high school dropout. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that always missing? Um, the, uh, uh, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to Wallace Center and uh, for everybody hopping on the on the phone here. And it's just so, such a even just around Niaz's work and Emma's work, um, and you know I'm a I'm one of the members, and and, and it's been a, a, a really important uh, community for me to be involved in. Um, what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about my history, sort of how I. Um, got here in this sort of age of ecological collapse and then paint a picture of what the world were doing underwater. It's a little hard to picture for folks. And then explore some of the short-term and long-term goals we have, sort of the vision of the future of the oceans. Um, and I'll say that we're excited for pushback, for questions, like poke holes in all of this. This is a journey of experimentation and um, I don't really know where we're going but uh, I just want to do it together and bring some rigor to it. So my story is, I would say it's one of ecological redemption. I was born in Newfoundland, Canada. My parents were draft dodgers out of Brooklyn. And um, I was born and raised there. And the worst thing happened to them, which is I became a, a, a sort of a Newfie outport fisherman. I uh, dropped out of high school. I fished, you know, Grand Banks, George's Banks, went to the Bering Sea. And this was the height of pillaging, everything we know, everything. Uh, Niaz is talking about it. Was, it we were tearing up whole e ecosystems. It was the um, rise of corporatization. 
of fish. Most of my fish was going to McDonald's uh, for their fish sandwiches. So, I mean, you can't get a more unsustainable form of food production and a, producing more unhealthy food than this. So, um, I, the cod stocks crashed back in my home, and that was a wake-up call. And a whole generation of us went on a search for sustainability, and we were young. We didn't know what that meant. It wasn't really environmentalism. It was much more like, okay, how do we spend 50 years working on the ocean? Our goal was and still is, how do we die on our boats uh, someday? And so I went to do aquaculture in northern Canada, salmon farms. That was supposed to be the answer to overfishing, uh, food security, and jobs was not. Right? We used to say we're growing neither fish nor food, pesticides, antibiotics, polluting local wa waters, privatization of the seas, all those things that we now know. You know, these were um, uh, aquaculture did Iowa pig farms at sea at f and first as its first step. And aquaculture is the worst brand name in the grocery store because of it. They deserve that uh, title, I think. Um, so then I kept searching, ended up in Long Island Sound and remade myself as an oysterman, sort of at the beginning of boutique um, uh, emergence of, of, sea, of seafood. I had the uh, third CSF in the, in the country, was living a, a great life, living in an Airstream trailer, uh, not rich but very happy. And then the storms hit, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy came through, wiped out 90% of my crop two years in a row. And then as a fisherman, as a farmer, I was a canary in a coal mine for a crisis that hit 100 years earlier than expected. And this is where I learned that climate change is not an environmental issue. It's an economic issue, that there will be no jobs in a dead ocean or a dead planet. And so, so much of how I think about environmental issues and ecological collapse is through that economic lens of just how do I make a living uh, and how do my folks, um, you know, pay for beer at the bar at night. Um, so uh, I had to adapt, right? And and but I wanted to adapt not just to sort of be resilient, but actually help address climate change and feed the feed uh, my local community. So I lifted my farm off bottom to be resilient to the hurricanes. I started growing a whole mix of different species, and I became the first 3D vertical ocean farmer growing a mix of seaweeds and shellfish to rebuild ecosystems, create jobs, and mitigate climate change. And we're using for feed fertilizer. Um, uh, uh, food and even uh, 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 at the edges some biofuel with waste. So that's what that's sort of how I got here. Now let's jump in and look at the farm. Can I do this? There we go. I think I pressed like eight times. So uh, high school kid did a picture of the farm here. It's you know cl close to correct and, and wonderful kid was out there with sketch pad. Um, and th imagine an underwater garden. You've got hurricane proof anchors at the edges and then down eight feet below the surface you've got a horizontal rope. And, and the buoys suspend, uh, suspend that rope. Um, from the line we grow our kelp vertically down, we have our scallops and lantern nets, we have mussels and mussel socks, and then below that system we have our oyster cages, which are like lobster cages. We grow our oysters and then clams are buried in the mud. Here is, just to give you a sense, here's a picture of the kelp. Uh, beautiful, we love it. It goes in post-hurricane season, one of the fastest growing plants on earth. That brown is, is it, you know, it, it, it grows by soaking up uh, nitrogen. We, um, here's our mussel socks over on the left, uh, lean proteins packed full of omega-3s, our scallops, and then our oyster cages that sit on the bottom. Um, let's see. This is, this is going slow. Let's see. Hold on. There we go. So here's a picture of the farm from the surface. Right? And I do farm tours, and it's the worst ripoff you could ever um, uh, get for a tour because there's not much to see. They pay like 500 bucks and go home disappointed. Um, and the, the, but we designed the farm on purpose like this because it has a low aesthetic impact. Our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places. We want our new ocean agricultural system to tread lightly. We have extremely small footprints. My farm used to be 100 acres. Now it's down to 20 acres, and I grow way more food than before. And anybody can boat and fish um, or swim on my farm. You can swim through our kelp forest. The, the best fishing in the entire region is on our farms. We do not privatize the oceans. We actually protect it. We create community spaces. And I don't even own that plot of ocean. All I own is the right to grow shellfish and seaweed. Anybody else can do whatever they want on, on it, commercially or recreational. I own a process, not a, um, a property. So we designed the farms really to do three things as we've evolved. One is to reimagine the seafood plate in this era of overfishing 
and climate change. So we're developing a delicious new seafood plot is what we're trying to do by doing by rejecting uh, aquaculture's obsession with monoculture and growing what people already want to eat. We grow for diversity, a sea basket approach, two types of seaweeds, four kinds of shellfish, and we harvest salt. But we've barely broken the surface. There are 10 thousand edible plants in the ocean, uh, hundreds of different kinds of shellfish. We only eat a few in terms of the seaweeds and basically zero grown in the U.S. And what we really want to do is invent a new native cuisine. Aquaculture, what it tried to do was um, uh, grow around existing wild tastes, right? They try to grow what people uh, uh, were eating already. Instead, what we're doing is rearranging the dinner plate to move bivalves and thousands of ocean plants into the center. Wild fish, like beef, like chicken, we want to remain on the plate, but it's to, it, it's, it's, it'll be on the edges um, us, um, as, we, as we get the, as the pressures of climate change uh, in, increase. But imagine being a chef in 2016 home chef or professional chef and discovering there are literally thousands of species. There's arugulas, tomatoes, rices, corns that you've never seen before, let alone cooked with before. Brooks Headley, one of my chefs in New York, says it's both exciting and daunting at the same time. So what we're trying to do is de uh, make kelp the new kale by cooking up barbecue kelp noodles with parsnips and breadcrumbs. This isn't even seafood, this is vegetables and you approach it that way. We have sea green butters, cheeses, bouillon cubes. We're going to use kelp as this gateway drug for a new ocean dinner that's creative, um, delicious and fun. Climate change is a depressing sector and the food sector can be very depressing. Um, uh, uh, we want to create a dinner that's fun and that we can dance around. So the other thing is our farms aren't just these little boot, like Brooklyn bearded boutique um, uh, uh, like uh, 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 businesses, right? We can grow 25 tons and 200,000 um, uh, uh, pieces of shellfish per acre. If you were to take a network of farms totaling the size of Washington State, um, we can technically uh, feed the world. And I think most importantly, this is zero input food. It requires no fresh water, no fertilizer, no feed. Um, making it hands down the most sustainable form of food production on the planet. And because water prices are going up, feed prices, fuel prices are going up, land prices, our, uh, our crops are going to be the most affordable food on the planet. This is regular people's food. This is the Gordon Fish stick of the future. question is, is it going to be delicious or, or like being uh, force-fed cod liver oil? Um, the second goal is to transform fishers uh, uh, into restorative ocean farmers that restore rather than deplete our oceans. And so we pick our crops carefully. Um, oysters are these incredible agents of sustainability, filtering 50 gallons of water a day, pulling nitrogen out of our water columns, which is the root cause of ocean dead zones. Our kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. The New Yorker called it the culinary equivalent of the electric car. Uh, our farm's function is artificial reefs for storm surges, uh, I mean uh, storm surge protectors and artificial reefs. We, we track over 150 species to our farm. My farm used to be a barren patch of ocean and now it's this thriving uh, ecosystem. Um, we're also using our crops because they're zero input to replace land-based inputs. So we work at Yale um, land, and a bunch of farmers here in, in, in our area um, to do, for example, a test on kelp-raised beef. The studies coming out now show that if you give cattle a kelp, majority kelp based diet, you get um, a 70 to 90 percent reduction in methane output and you get this beautiful like salt marsh French tasting beef and it's umami filled and it's just delicious. And the real idea, you know, we use it for fertilizers as well, is to build a bridge between land and sea because all our thinking about the food system, as Nia says, is stops at the uh, water's edge. And then most importantly for me, quite honestly, is we're building a foundation around jobs, justice and the restorative uh, economy, right? I'm not an environmentalist. I grew up shooting moose out of the kitchen window. My first job on the boats was, was killing as many seagulls as possible with a shotgun. <laughs> um, but so I wouldn't be doing this unless it created jobs for the 40% of people in my town that are unemployed, that are fishermen, unless it opened up new doors of economic, um, uh, to, uh, economic opportunity and food justice. So to do this, what we did, and we're an organization 
of farmers, we're farmer run, uh, created Greenway, well, fisherman farmer run. Um, we got a Greenway, which is a nonprofit, for profit hybrid, and it's a three legged strategy. First, we replicate our farming model. Second, we build infrastructure so we can go to scale. And third, we develop new markets for the farmers' crops. So, to replicate, oh, that's Greenwave. Next. Um, so to replicate, what we did was we open sourced our model. Everyone wanted me to franchise. No, what we need is open source if we want this to spread. So anybody with 20 acres and a boat and $30,000 can start their own farm and be up and uh, uh, selling the first year. The whole idea is to design around simplicity. Um, so there's low capital costs, minimal skill requirements. I call it the nail salon model of the sea, right? Growing the ocean and st structuring basic scaffolding systems in the ocean instead of pens and things like that. We don't have to fight gravity, so this is really cheap to do. And it's $25 an acre to access um, old plots of ocean. This is this is why we have Latino indigenous folks. We've got um, uh, 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 11th generation fishermen who's out of work, third generation lobstermen um, coming to us because there's a low barrier to entry. And this is why we won the Buckminster Fuller, uh, Fuller Prize because the trick to replication is is not complexity. Um, so to get the farmers the farm off the ground, we have startup grants for our farmers and their, our training program. They get free seed. We help them with permitting. They get gear from Patagonia. And most importantly, we guarantee to purchase um, up to 80% of their crop at triple the market rate for three years. This allows farmers to get up and going, learn to grow, but not sacrifice their livelihoods. I mean, um, you know, 91% of farmers on land lost money in 2012, the last year we have numbers. We're not going to replicate that uh, economy, so our farmer training program is, is, is really trying to give people a good starting ramp. We run, run school to farm programs at inner city schools. We've got an artist in re residence uh, program, a fellowship for chefs. We're really trying to create, create a culture um, of uh, like creativity and fun. We're developing underwater community gardens. Um, at the second piece is we're building infrastructure. So what happens when the trouble with ocean farming is you hit land and it gets expensive. So we're, we're combining resources both in the nonprofit and for-profit. We just created the nation's largest seaweed hatchery for farmers and a training program. We did that with Yukon. Our new seafood hub is designed to be an engine of food justice. And this is really important to me. We embed our land-based infrastructure for ocean farming in the communities that need it most. It's one, our, our seafood and hatchery in one of the uh, poorest neighborhoods in the entire East Coast. This is our chance, right, to embed good jobs, food access, nutrition, community involvement, CSFs, um, uh, and make sure they're woven into the ocean economy exactly uh, right from the start. The last piece of the... Um, um, the Greenway program is market development. Uh, so to increase demand for farmers' crops, to 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 to, um, uh, uh, to uh, you know allow them to capture more of the value chain, we have R&D programs around kelp pastas, umami juice bombs, she sea shine, which is our kelp moonshine, and then we're using waste for livestock feed, fertilizers. Working with the Department of Energy on potential biofuel, like 50 years off, who knows if that'll be a good idea. We're developing new systems to lower um, you know energy use, and and we're working with with large institutions, universities, places like Google, Yale, to create secure markets for our crop, farmers, farmers crop. I mean, yeah, farmers crops. So uh, let's see. I th am I freezing here? I think I'm freezing. Oh, there we go. So the, the vision here is to create green wave reefs where you have 25 to 50 farms um, dotting the coastline, surrounded by conservation zones, um, uh, uh, hatcheries and seafood hubs on land, surrounded by a ring of institutional buyers to stabilize prices and a ring of entrepreneurs doing value added uh, products. And then you take that Green Wave Reef and you replicate it every 200 miles. Everywhere there's a Home Depot, we want to put a Green, green Wave Reef. And what you start to get is a sort of a Napa Valley uh, of Marwar. And I think that's where we, uh, uh, you know, we'd really like to be in 10 years. Um, so just to close, I mean, I, what's exciting for me is probably the first time in history we have the chance to plan ahead. Right? We can learn from our mistakes on land-based agriculture. I mean, seed is owned by, land-based seed is owned by three 
uh, global companies. 50, sorry, 53% of the glo global seed supply is owned by three companies. A seed is one of the biggest inputs for farmers. That's a reason why farmers can't make any money on land. We're going to take that problem out of the equation. Our hatchery stays on the nonprofit. Everything is uh, at cost. We're going to learn from those mistakes, and we're going to learn from the mistakes of, of aquaculture, the industrialized, polluting, privatizing model. And we're going to build this food system from the bottom up because this is our chance to really build food the right way around polyculture, not monoculture, uh, protect rather than privatize, and ensure beginning farmers have access. And it's our chance to invent this, invent whole new occupations to feed the planet and lift our communities out of poverty, reduce inequality, all the while growing this beautiful delicious food and I think this is for whether it's whether it's fishermen whether you know fishers whether it's folks on land whether um, no matter who it is this is our chance to look around the country look around the world um, to find solutions to uh, different pieces of the puzzle to ensure that all of us can make a, a living on a living planet thanks so much Thank you, Vern. <clears throat> that was fascinating, fascinating. Um, so now uh, we enter our Q&A period, and there are quite a few questions. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, please feel free to uh, write in your uh, in your questions as well. Um, w one uh, one quick question uh, for Bren. There's a question here about um, I I've heard terrible things about uh, aquaculture. There's uh, um, talking about, um, uh, well, I'm trying to summarize here, uh, the, the uh, fish, fish escaping from nets and um, ecological degradation. Can you, can you comment on that? Sure. Um, uh, exactly. I mean, and it gets worse than that. I mean, I went to the Clinton Global Initiative on Aquaculture um, no, had no one didn't know what to expect, and it was these the soy. It was all soy industry people, right? If there's growing soy, of course, is extremely destructive, and now they want to feed it to the fish, right? The aquaculture. You'll never hear me talk about aquaculture. This is about small-scale ocean farmers combining with small-scale fishers in order to create a, a future. See, it's all it's all about what to grow. Everybody in aquaculture went in to grow what everyone wants to eat, which is salmon, tuna, things like that. No, we ask the oceans, what can you provide us? What can we grow um, uh, that both can feed the planet, but also restores um, uh, uh, restores our oceans at the same time? The trick is just to pick creatures that you don't have to feed, um, you don't have to fertilize, uh, and then you, the zero input food is really the way to go in terms of ocean farming. And this is why, you know, land-based prices for you know corn is supposed to spike 100 what 50 percent in the next 15 years, things like that. Zero input food, whoever's doing it, that's what's what's going to food uh, feed folks in my community. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, a question for Niaz. Um, this is a long one, so hang on. Um, you acknowledge that MSC standards are a good starting point, yet there is a need to go deeper with regards to values and sustainability. Do you work with MSC or other standard or certification agencies as you go deeper or work inter uh, independently? And then a second question um, or follow-up, how do you impact those agencies amidst all the clutter of those groups working in the broader third-party certification space so that clarity in the marketplace is achieved so that it's simpler for consumers? Well, let me start with the last point, simpler for consumers. Um, simplicity is partially what's brought us here. I don't want to create a system that people feel overwhelmed by what's around them. But honestly, people should feel sufficiently whelmed about this decision-making process. What we're often told by people in the, that support the status quo is a dead fish is a dead fish. It doesn't matter how it was killed or who killed it. That to me is like saying a dead pig is a dead pig. It doesn't matter how it was raised and how it was killed and, and where it ends up after it's killed. And so a lot of the existing systems may be simple, but they reduce the life of that fish or that marine animal to that, to that pig that's grown in a CAFO style and, and we're really just looking at numbers, not at lives of animals anymore. So it's okay to have a complex system. 
in fact, the Earth is a complex system, and so we really need to honor that, and we need to challenge ourselves to think differently and to actually think. One of the things that we were told by, we do talk with um, the existing certifications and, and the list and so on, uh, it's not always friendly conversations, uh, mostly because we're, we're, we're throwing a challenge out there. Um, to them, and um, and at the same time, I take responsibility for the challenge not often being thrown out there in the most um, diplomatic way because it gets kind of emotional at times when you work with fishermen who are who are struggling, and you look at marine ecosystems that are equally struggling under the current system. And so, you know, my goal isn't to make people feel they're stupid. I want them to really walk out of there thinking, "Huh, I got to think differently." And so. Um, but when, when we do have a conversation, we're often told by those who operate the existing systems, people don't want to think. People just want to be told what to do. Well, I think that's not the case with society. And if nothing else, this current election system is helping us really realize that we do need to think. And we do need to um, really dive deep in our own values as human beings and see how we want to interact with ecosystems uh, as, as non-human um, creatures of this planet. And so, in terms of the Marine Stewardship Council in particular, I have not been a fan since day one. I, I was at Greenpeace at the time that the Marine Stewardship Council was formed. It was formed, uh, we were told, in the image of the, um, the FSC Forest Stewardship Council, but it became pretty clear that uh, that was not going to be the case. So I've had hesitations about the MSC since uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and the relationship has been rocky ever since. And a recent report, a study that came out, actually shows, suggests, uh, proves, I'm happy to send the link to the study to anybody who, is, who wants to send me a message after this, um, that says, shows that the MSC is actually lowering the bar instead of increasing um, or, or, or setting it higher for us. So I feel like there is probably more potential in um, some of the systems that don't make it so that as long as you can pay for it, you can get certified, which is what the current system of MSC seems to be. So, um, so I don't know where that leaves us with the MSC relationship. I think there is more potential with the other systems and certifications that are there to change how they think, but the MSC um, uh, is, is, is a choice that we've decided not to really engage any longer because we just, we just um, are in such different places when it comes to the underlying values. Great. All right. That's, that's um, thank you. Good, good complete answer. Um, there's a, a comment um, from Christine. Just this summer in Port William, Kentucky, I heard Wendell Berry repeat something about land-based food production, production that he has said many times before that is an echo of essentially the same thing that Bren said about the ocean, um, which is uh, we need to ask the land what it can provide for us, not force the land to grow what we want. So there you go. Um, well, chills. Yeah, that's a, that's a great quote. And, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was in a doctor's office, and there was a, a copy of um, American Poetry, I think it's the magazine, that was on in the waiting room. And the title poem was in the ocean and the tablespoon. And of course, immediately caught my eye. And it made me realize, and the Brent spoke to this, and, and Christine and the Wendell Berry reference speaks to this, is that when it comes to the ocean and maybe the rest of the planet, we've really reduced it to what we can fit in our tablespoon. And if, if it fits in our tablespoon, it's the only thing we value as opposed to really thinking about the ocean as a system we honor and being really grateful for whatever it gives us that fills our tablespoons as opposed to force it to produce the things that we've grown a taste for. The last time I was in a doctor's office, they told me I was going to be crippled within 15 years because I destroyed my body so much. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you throw your you throw everything into work, Bren. <laughs> Bren, I, I have a, another question for you. You mentioned um, uh, a, the promise to uh, pay three times the market rate. So um, there's an assumption uh, that there's some funding behind that. Um, is is that the case? Is there is there philanthropic or governmental funding to allow you to do that? Um, I mean, actually, we're able to um, 
sell it out the other side under GreenWave in or I mean the GreenWave built the processing center so that was um, foundation based for sure it's a space where our farmers can come experiment they can process on their own um, but our relationship with the larger institutions where we open our books and say hey this is how much everybody's making we want to make sure the farmers are, are, are okay and we just we've been building those relationships for a long time that we're able to um, sell it out the uh, outside as um, at a profit now the question is uh, um, I mean, our trouble now is we're starting to really move to scale. We have enough farms coming up. You know, we have farms, 20 farms coming online, and we have requests to start farms in every coastal state in North America and 40 countries around the world. What do we do with all that? Well, our first thing we're doing is moving from our smaller seafood hub, where we're building a processing center that will be able to process about a million pounds uh, of kelp a year. Um, and that that... Um, what I don't know, because I don't want to give too rosy a picture, what's the price going to be when we have, I mean, it's a $7 billion industry, it's growing globally, we have, no one can get locally um, uh, uh, fresh sourced seaweed, so we have a real advantage there, mm -hmm. but right now the price point is all over the place, so I think the challenge for me is, and for all of us is going to be, let's not turn it into a commodity uh, in the same way that's happened on land, mm. where both it, it peaks in tanks and farmers can't make a living. And that's the role of GreenWave, right? The intermediary to create those marketing networks, to create the relationships and explain like food, we can figure out a price where people can afford it and farmers can make uh, a living if we open our books, if we're really sort of honest about um, uh, uh, what it's taking to grow and you know, what does it take to live as a farmer? If you're talking about scaling up, though, how do you how do you not make it a commodity? Oh, sorry. When I think of as a commodity as something that just you know, what do I know? I school drop up, but that that peaks and crashes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you stabilize prices like we tried to do in what the 30s, um, uh, in in the in the New Deal, um, and you know, I, who knows about government regulation? But our nonprofit can play that role. Um, uh, to just to ensure that we're we're setting a floor for our farmers that can make a living. Basically, we, you know, the global price for kelp right now is about thirty six cents a, a pound. Well, that's actually the U.S. Um, uh, rate. Um, we pay minimum a dollar a pound, and that's based on me farming for a lot of years and realizing what's the minimum. Like that's one of them. Like, uh, like what's the price that allows me to to want to keep farming uh, and to grow and expand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say this issue of price is so critical. When it comes to wild capture fisheries, we know majority of the fishermen don't even come near, much like farmers, don't come near to meeting their cost of production. Much rather paying for school uh, books, clothes, health insurance, half of the mortgage for the family. And um, what we realized a couple of years ago when we did some back of envelope calculations was that majority of the fishermen were, were on average getting paid about 65 cents a pound less than what they needed to just to make ends meet on their business alone. And that's when we began to coin the term fishing in the red and farmers are farming in the red. By the time the fish gets to the dock, they're already in debt. By the time the produce is grown, the farmer is already in debt. We're eating off their backs. And we know that already in the society, but we don't know that when it comes to the fishermen because we've assumed that fishermen are, ma are making a killing because that's what we hear in the news. That's what the story is in, in the current narrative is that the fishermen are greedy and they're making all the money when the majority of fishermen we work with can barely pay the mortgage on their boat much rather than mortgage on their home. So we need to really take responsibility for making sure that fishermen are getting paid a fair price. Whether they're catching a fish that costs us 14 bucks a pound to, to Buy or 22 bucks a pound because it costs the same for them to catch it. Their cost of operation doesn't change if they're catching whiting or if they're catching haddock. It's the same cost, the amount of money they're going to pay for fuel, the same crude cost that goes into it, the same ice cost, but somehow as a society we've decided whiting is worth five cents a pound, cod is worth 22 cents a pound, and fishermen is not worth getting paid a fair price in it. Mm. And it was, you know, 
uh, come on our plates. Mm -hmm. Just let me say one quick thing, I'll do it really quickly, which is from Greenway's perspective, and it's, it's trying to learn the lessons from land and sea and not recreate them. The question we always have is along the production chain, what, what things do we keep nonprofit or at cost and what pieces are for profit? Mm -hmm. Our view is, of course, training nonprofit, the hatchery, the seed staying under the nonprofit wing has been absolutely essential in order um, to reduce costs for farmers, and we're going to keep it there. Um, the production side, the processing is really capital intensive, but all of what we're seeing that actually can run as a productive business, we're paying our workers, our minimum wage is $15 an hour um, uh, starting, uh, for no matter what your job is. Uh, we hire, um, we don't require resumes, so we hire former felons, undocumented workers, all this sort of stuff. But that can be an end, that can be a for-profit entity. And so we're just looking at breaking off every piece and saying where in the equation does this uh, end so we don't recreate exactly what Nias is talking about. Good, and there, there is a question from Christy about uh, the uh, social justice piece of your operation, Brandon. I, I think we, we just heard some of it. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's funny, I, I wrote the, this piece in the New York Times saying don't let your children grow up to be farmers and that was all about sort of the emptiness of the new food economy. It's been, it's been this incredible journey which who would have guessed we'd have food as cent good food as a central discussion um, in the U.S. It's a beautiful journey but the, we haven't figured out the economics. We, all farmers are losing money. We're lying to all our customers, the farmers markets when we're shutting down <laughs> at the end of the day are a very depressing uh, place and I base this all on experience and lots of discussion. When that piece was published, I had farmers calling me up and crying on the phone. I got thousands, literally, of emails. So it's a, um, it's a really sad saying. I'm sure everybody on the phone knows this. But um, so, but wh what the food justice people used to say to me is, "Come sell your oysters in poor neighborhoods," and I was like, "I can't make money. I can't even. I can't even pay gas bills." Um, uh, if I price something in, at the at the rate that people can afford, and for the food justice people, their role as organizers is to figure out how farmers can make money, how fishermen can make money, and poor and you know poor and working class people can can afford to buy the food. And I think that piece of the equation is really uh, really uh, missing. I mean, we try, like our. We, you know, we have the advantage of, like I keep saying, is sort of planning ahead. And so I had a, some investors that wanted to put uh, the, you know, the seafood hub in like some rich area. Um, and no, and I said, no, we're not, I'm not going to recreate this, um, uh, this problem. And I had other investors say, we need full vertical integration of single companies owning farms, processing centers, all the way out to value added products. And I was like, no, I, fishermen, farmers don't want to work for other people. Th this just transition is about me owning my own boat, not having a boss, succeeding in failing on my own terms, helping and feed the country, um, not just working for some some big a big company. And so, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'll stop there because I'll just keep going. Uh, the the uh, discussion about uh, price has brought up some interesting points. Um, in uh, let me let me just draw this one out though, uh, which is that um, uh, there there is. Uh, there is a lot of consumer interest uh, in some of these uh, uh, top feeders, the the tuna and, and uh, other fish like this. There's just a sort of uh, culinarily seems very attractive, uh, whereas uh, mussels, for instance, uh, and kelp at this point are uh, culinarily less attractive. So uh, how do we get how do we get beyond that? One of the um, things that we're doing. Yes, you take it. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> One of the things that we've been doing, we realize, even for, uh, you know, Brent works with kelp, for example. Yes, there's a challenge there. The um, but we also work with fishermen who are catching species that people haven't even heard. You know, in New England, um, there are over 60 species that are landed on our docks, and yet the average chef knows maybe about 10 or 12 of them. The average home cooks probably know less fewer than, than even that number. And um, so for an average fisherman, 
the rest of that 50 some odd species that they catch, it's already dead, is often thrown overboard because there is no value uh, that society puts on it that, that makes them want to bring it to shore uh, more often. So one of the things that we've decided to do as part of our work to launch community supported fisheries was to reintroduce us to the diversity of species. Uh, th this idea that even wild capture fisheries have been turned into monoculture approach to fishing is something mm -hmm. we need to unsee. And so we've been um, doing these events called seafood throwdowns that are educational opportunities. We, uh, and some of the photos that I showed in, in uh, the PowerPoint was really photos of those events that help us have a non-threatening fun environment at a farmer's market or a food festival where people get to actually try uh, species they haven't seen before, heard before, tasted before, and chefs get to use species that are not familiar to them. We've had chefs from hospitals um, to home cooks uh, using species unfamiliar to them, and we're hoping over the last eight years that these events have been introducing people. We've seen, for instance, with some of the hospitals that participated in our seafood throwdowns, that they've begun to use some of those species in their cafeterias. We've even had demonstrations in hospital cafeterias, we did, uh, Boston Medical Center and Boston Children's Hospital being two of them and in university dining halls so that people can start becoming familiar with these other animals that are already caught in the existing seafood system but they're not either not brought to shore or if they're brought to shore their value is so little that fishermen are back to fishing in the red. We actually have, uh, there are two seafood throwdowns coming down this weekend. For those who are interested, there is one at the Boston Local Food Festival featuring Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Chef Philip Robinson. Um, and then the Outer Banks of North Carolina, a day at the docks on Saturday, there's a seafood throwdown. And we're here at Farm Aid. That's where I am at the moment because even with Farm Aid, We've been working with them to um, change the food, the seafood that they serve to back the stage, the VIP tent, even the vendors bringing Spanish mackerel, which most people don't know about for, uh, for, farm, uh, for the farm aid crew to be able to try. So any opportunity we find to introduce people to these other species that are already within our system, uh, we do, but we want to do it in a way that people really engage as opposed to in a way that's finger wagging, which is why the seafood throwdowns create the right environment for us. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me just jump in real quick. I mean, uh, I, mean I love Niaz's work on this. and It's uh, the, the the ch the challenge is, is that if we and I know Niaz, you're doing more than this, but it's like so important that this isn't just about taste because if we shift the taste to underutilize species with with the same fishing system, we're just doing a transition to destroy younger, I mean smaller fish, right? We actually need a completely new a new approach. I I think we're too obsessed with fish. I mean I hate seaweeds. I would never eat it. I'm like <laughs> at the gas station. I got this stuff's disgusting, right? But we're so obsessed with with fish that conversation about plants just hasn't entered, um, isn't um, you know just isn't on the table. There's an entire Western culinary history of seaweeds. The Italians were using it for generations. There's a kelp highway that runs up Peru and and um, uh, all the way through Chile, uh, where where seaweeds were used just for you know um, uh, 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 hundreds of years. We pick kelp because our kelp, everywhere we grow, it tastes different, just like terroir. It's extremely mild tasting. Uh, it's a bright green when you cook it, and it turns into a wonderful mild uh, noodle. So that's why it's the great gateway drug to de -sushify. My wife, my poor wife, had to cook uh, last month for Rene Renzepi, David Chang, Alex Attilo, who were all on the boat, and a couple other chefs, um, and she had to cook them kelp. Uh, noodles, and they came, and uh, Rene Renzepi came back for thirds, and he was, you know, world class, you know, number one chef in the world, and he's like, I've never tasted uh, kelp like this. It's not what I thought of. The last piece is that the economics are going to drive us to eat these weird, disgusting things because it's zero inputs. And we will be eating, like I said, we'll be eating it in 30 years, 50 years, 10 years, just depends what the planet does to us. Um, so it's just time to make it delicious and, and to change the American palate. I mean, I've taken the most disgusting thing from the sea as possible, and let's see if we can get Americans to eat it. No, Brian, I agree with you. You can't switch people's taste to other species under the current system. That's why prefacing the businesses that we work with that are actually adopting a whole new set of values that not only are not supported by existing certifications, but by 
a lot of the fishermen that currently fish. And so the businesses that we work to promote within the seafood throwdowns or that we'll bring to Farm Aid are businesses that we know are embodying these values so that we're not simply shifting the burden of our palates and our plates into other species and really um, uh, that putting even more value and more power into the existing system. And talk about someone who didn't like kelp. I was a vegetarian when I started this work. I didn't even know what a cod looked like or tasted like when I started to work on fisheries issues. And the reason I began to do this work wasn't so much that I wanted to eat diversity of species, which is key here. It's not so much focusing on one or the other species, it's diversity of species is key here. It's because I saw the same social and economic and environmental injustices when I was fighting an incinerator in Ohio happening with a boat in Gloucester or, or in Alaska or in the Outer Banks. So it was those things that I saw that were the common denominator. I could actually, I sort of saw the marine conservation movement as a Save the Whales movement, which is nothing wrong with it, but I just didn't see those other things that were important to me and it took some educating of me by other folks to make me see those things. So I've now, as one fisherman tells me, um, eat anything that doesn't bite me back. So my palate has changed, but my values have not. Interesting, so fascinating. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Luke has a question for Niaz. Um, is it possible to support sustainable value-based fisheries on a scale larger than what Luke is calling community-based? And what might that look like? I think that's the work uh, ahead of us at the moment. And that's why Brent's work is also really important because we cannot expect the ocean and marine animals to feed us. And I don't want us to get to the point where we are looking at how do you scale this up? I want to know how we scale this out, not scale it up. I want to know how we can really empower more and more small-scale fishermen to catch the 40 pounds, the 50 pounds, the 100 pounds, and bring it to shore. And I want to, I want to see more processors and more aggregators that value the 50 pounds and the 100 pounds and don't expect fishermen to have to make ends meet by bringing more volume of single species in. So the system needs to change. The system that currently only values high volume, low value, production system needs to change. It's not only the fishermen that need to change the way they work. It's the processor. It's the buyer at the dock. It's the chef in the restaurant. It's the hospital. It's the entire system. And that may seem really um, uh, like a big task, but we've done the ocean a great injustice, and it's our responsibility to take on this big task and really look at every single link in this chain and see what needs to change on the boat, what needs to change at the dock, what needs to change at the distribution system, in the distribution system, what needs to change on our plate, and what needs to change when it comes to the economic infrastructure and the working waterfronts that we need to have in order to support this kind of community-based approach to, um, to systems. Unfortunately, where this change can happen is within the world that's currently tackling this issue in the land food system. And I get frustrated often when we get invited to present at a conference and they tell me, well, we have one workshop on fisheries and it's a three-day conference and I'm looking at the various panels. There's an economic panel, there's a distribution panel, there's an aggregation panel. I'm thinking, do you not think that those things apply if we want to change the seafood system? Mm -hmm. Things that apply to our land food system, all of them apply to our seafood system. So my challenge to those working on food system issues is almost every conversation you're having applies to the ocean world. And we can start taking responsibility by bringing it into it because that's the only way we can scale out this work so that we can have community-based fishermen, the family farmers element, the, the small and medium scale folks, and, and actually be able to feed the world. And I think the, feed, the world can feed itself. As Jim Goodman, a farmer, has said to uh, Occupy Wall Street is, the world can feed itself. Fishing communities can feed themselves. Coastal communities can feed themselves only if we let them. We often don't let people feed themselves because we want to control the system. You know, the, the, here's, 
here's where I start having like I totally agree with all that. The whale in the room is climate change, right? which is we know there's going to be we're expecting a 10 billion loss in revenue because of climate change in the fishing industry in the next 30 years. And one out of four marine species are threatened with extinction. Like, and the big question is, can wild fish bear that burden, and can farm fish burn, bear that burden? I'd say neither, right, in the era of climate change. And so what's the role of the fish, just like what's the role of meat um, on land on this new plate that we're all trying to create? And I don't think it's either or, but I don't see a solution without transforming fishermen into sort of ocean farmers that are growing some sort of new climate cuisine. Like climate change, this is not business as usual in terms of an ecological crisis. This is not like the collapse, the cod stocks. It's not like overfishing, things like that. This is, we all know it, it's an existential crisis. We have to eat radically different. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, our poor wild fish, I think, can only play a piece of that. I agree with you. And that's, yep. that's why I think diversity, scale, is so important and that we cannot rely on any one source of food to feed us in the in the age of climate change. On the subject of climate change, it's worth noting that when it comes to the recovery of marine species or recovery of marine ecosystems, the current law that is charged with protecting those ecosystems, it's called the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act. We think it should be renamed the Fish Bill because nobody can remember that long name. <laughs> but the, that current law does not require that we address climate change when we look at is cod coming, can cod come back, can marine ecosystems um, return to a healthy state. It doesn't require us to look at oil and gas exploration and fossil fuel as a threat to wild marine ecosystems. It doesn't require that we look at extraction of, of minerals from our ocean bottom as a way of, um, of whether or not that's affecting recovery of wild ecosystems. So I think one of the things that we can do is require that that law not only address fishing impact, which it should, but non-fishing impacts such as climate change, oil and gas exploration, deforestation, uh, runoff from industrial agriculture, because all of those, it's not just fishing, that it's not only fishing that undermines the health of marine ecosystems, it's all these other non-fishing issues that the law is not required mm -hmm. to take into account. And a real blatant example of that, let's look at BP oil spill. When, uh, when that happened, one of the things that we heard a lot about is the migration of bluefin tuna, a species that many of us are concerned about. And yet, the course correction for the re reduction in the spawning of, of uh, uh, bluefin tuna that we saw on the horizon was to limit the amount of fishing. Nothing wrong with that, but nobody calls for a ban on oil and gas exploration in the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. that was in charge of policy making where we knew that had a direct result on those animals. So until we look at all the different things that are affecting the marine ecosystem and until we look at all of our options when it comes to food, including what you're proposing, Brent, then we, we are not going to solve the problem. We cannot rely on one body of water or one piece of land to feed anybody. All right. This is awesome. And I'm, I, 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 uh, hearing, hearing the two of you talk to each other is, is really, is awesome. It's, it's exactly, uh, what I was hoping for. I mean, there's, uh, what's, what's interesting to me is, um, you have, uh, you are, uh, looking at two sides of, uh, the same coin, right? Two very different approaches to fishing and yet, both approaches are committed to improving sustainability. It's uh, so, and that's sustainability of the environment, but also of the fishermen's business businesses. Um, Nama and Gre Greenwave uh, have uh, documented protocols and principles uh, that are uh, very public, um, and that uh, consumers and fishermen alike uh, are able to uh, get behind um, and really sort of uh, sign on to. Um, and uh, th the support for the fishermen comes in various ways. It's it's finding markets. It's making good business decisions. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, and and more. Um, these are two impactful and uh, and uh, um, complementary approaches 
that move us to a much more responsible treatment of the ocean. And I hope that uh, there is great success in both of your efforts. Um, so I, I really want to give you both a, a heartfelt thank you. I think this was a, a important contribution to the National Good Food Network webinars. Um, Thanks so much for having us. Just been an honor. Oh, great. So let me let me give a little closeout information. Um, we uh, usually offer our NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month, uh, and uh, we do record all of our webinars. Uh, they're available on our website, ngfn.org/webinars. This one should be available within a, a few business days. Uh, but feel free to dig through our archives. They're oh about sixty or seventy strong at this point. So uh, you, you can uh, dig into that which interests you. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, that uh, the University of Vermont uh, offers a uh, blend of hands-on uh, community-based and online campus learning for uh, food hub managers. Um, it's, this is the only professional certificate program. Uh, Wall Center and many other professionals uh, have been involved in uh, shaping the program. Uh, four or six month programs, uh, really a, a fantastic opportunity. You can visit learn.uvm edu uh, and you can find us the uh, wall center and the national good food network uh, on youtube uh, we're on twitter twitter the, we have uh, ngfn.org uh, and wallacecenter.org uh, and we're we like to be a little bit of everywhere uh, and um, if you haven't signed up for our uh, email updates uh, you can uh, there's a link on uh, our website ngfn.org uh, or just let us know on our post webinar survey which will be popping up in just a second um, thank you for your time again um, please fill out the survey uh, and have a wonderful afternoon again Bren Niaz thank you so much thank you, thank you.